Hey, DF, this is a question for Alex, but of course I'm interested in everyone's thoughts. Uh, thanks for that. Oh. Uh, DLSS3 and FSR3 are really cool technologies, but because of the input lag penalty and other artifacts, oh, we got to talk about that. Oh, yeah. I think that I have to think of them as quote unquote advanced motion blur options that can leverage higher refresh rates to make them make sense. To, to, for them to make sense to enable, which got me thinking, why don't these technologies incorporate an advanced motion blur in them optionally? To be honest, in-game motion blur already looks pretty poor with yeah. frame gen enabled. And if their algorithms can generate entirely new frames, surely they could use that input to generate an extremely attractive motion blur. Doubt. Alex, thoughts? Doubt. Um, <laughs> was uh, it press X to so doubt scenario? Press X to it's doubt. A, it was... Uh, the one thing I'll say is that the interesting thing is very interesting way you put this because the thing that frame gen does is it actually decreases motion blur because it's in making your display's persistence lower. It's actually adding clarity to the game. And that's one thing you'll notice. You play a game at 60 on a monitor that's 120, the persistence even you know frame gen has artifacts the persistence being higher where you see technically more information in a shorter amount of time it looks clearer to my eyes even if the fact that there could be artifacts in that image um and for me the artifacting in frame gen if you're playing it at a inherent 60 internal and then going up to 120 or higher uh, a lot of people have 144 hertz monitors 165 whatever um then you're you're getting like I don't think the artifacts are so big. I I mean I, I'm an artifact stickler. I talk about them well, all the you, time. Well, you've specified in your first DLSS three review video how you know how and where the artifacts do present and yeah. whether they actually persist into you know something noticeable over time. And that's the thing is like yeah, and they don't persist into something completely noticeable. A lot of the lot of the time, which is surprising, considering how technically artifact ridden the image is, uh, versus a cleanly rendered one. So it's interesting, and I would say like it isn't actually that bad for most use case scenarios, and I would say most users definitely wouldn't notice it. I think that you something you could probably comment on, Rich and John, is the input latency difference. Now it will differ mm. per game, uh, and. Uh, because it isn't just flat. It's also like what the game is doing a little bit. Reflex is yep. going in there and helping it out a lot. But in general, it isn't so big, at least on the Reflex NVIDIA side. We'll have to talk about FSR 3 soon enough. But Rich? Well, the, the point I make is that um, uh, the thing is, I think input lag is all about consistency. I'm going to go back again to the table that Tom put together years ago about all of these 60 FPS games on PlayStation 4. And, you know, you've got Call of Duty uh, with an input lag of, you know, in the 30 millisecond region, which is really, really super fast. Super and fast. you've got uh, Doom Eternal, which was like, and a couple of other games, which are like 70, 80 milliseconds. And they're running at 60 frames per second. Go back in time and to when those games launched and nobody was saying, Man, Doom Eternal, Halo 5, these games, they're so laggy. It's like playing at 30 FPS. Um, <laughs> when in actual fact, there's like a 50 millisecond gap between, you know, that and Call of Duty. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just think that maybe there's kind of like a sliding scale of input lag and noticeability depending on the individual. And um, I don't really see frame gen lag for the most part as being an issue. There is going to be, of course, some games where it is a problem, right? But for the most part, it's, 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 you know, I wouldn't say it becomes unplayable, right? No. But I, I think Not it's maybe something, I mean, it's a really good added feature, I think. And, um, you know, the fact that it makes stuff like um, Cyberpunk 2077 RT Overdrive actually viable is is a is a good thing to have right. and you know this is basically um you know amd are doing frame generation now we've spoke to intel about it they're obviously all in on it as well and the end game is going to be at some point in the future um games will generate frames up to the refresh rate of your display and right. that is you know that's what they're going to be doing and they're all in on it you know every one of those major vendors are, are doing it so, yeah, I mean, obviously it's something that needs to be tested and keep an eye on it. 
Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's a feature that I enable if it enables me to get more out of my high refresh rate display simply because it looks better overall on, in, you know, in on aggregate. aggregate. Yeah. Similar to DLSS, uh, you know, the, the, the controversies back in the day about that. It's kind of mostly gone now. There are one or two bad implementations that come along or features that aren't working as they should be. But, uh, right. yeah, I mean, that's the, what I've got to say about that. But what about this concept of using frame generation to do better motion blur? That doesn't hmm. kind of make I mean, actually, you should be doing decent motion blur to begin with, right? I yeah, I was so. actually going to say it's the opposite that I'm interested in. Right. Uh, having spoken with like Mark from Blurbusters before on this topic, he kind of pegs 1000 hertz as like the target for achieving mm. CRT like motion clarity. Uh, with sample and hold without having to do pulsing or, you know, black frame insertion or anything like that. And I feel like the way to get there is through these sort of frame generation techniques, right? Like the monitors and stuff to do that still, like there's, there's so much still to overcome, but I feel like when we eventually get there, like doing a native 1000 frames per second is kind of off the table, right? Right. So, but if there's ways to generate frames and keep it responsive, I feel like that's the future we need to move towards in, t in terms of getting true, perfect motion clarity while maintaining all other characteristics of the image, including yeah. brightness. When we get there, it's going to look insane. Isn't frame generation with low latency basically happening in VR now, John? Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. How low? I, it's hard to say. So, like... Uh, that's what like the the asynchronous space warp is uh that the meta quest line has and the thing is is it does have some some limitations like if you have like a transparent objects especially really close to the camera you'll actually start to see the double image effect or some artifacts things like that but for the overall experience considering the low processing power available i think they do an exceptional job right and it does convincingly allow 45 frames per second to look like 90 frames per second when in optimal conditions mm -hmm. and that's you know that's 30 from a pretty low base and it still feels really responsive even though your base frame rate is only like 45 right right so i i feel like going up from there it can only get better so the interesting mm, thing stuff. is we've always talked about it, but like, I think as the hardware improves, whatever's after ADA, whatever's after RDNA three could technically start doing multiple in between frames and not just one, because yeah. that is, there's obviously a computational cost about this. That's why M Ampere can't do it. Right. Yeah. That's why when you go down the stack frame gen on FSR three also becomes more expensive. And when you're GPU limited. So, right. so I think that's a totally a, future thing and i'm not so down on it i i don't i'm not so down on frame jet i'm very excited about the future like there considering the trajectory we saw with dlss one